All right, let's continue on to part four of our series on multiplexers by talking about Verilog parameters. So in the previous tutorial, we schematically drew a two to one multiplexer that had a bus width of four bits wide. Right. We want to see how we would handle that in Verilog. And so we've actually then sized some signals before in Verilog. We've seen that when we declare them, when we put the size out to the left, we can specify how many bits are in that signal. Right. So if we wanted to make the data eight bits wide, we'd say seven down to zero, right? six down to zero, seven bits wide, four bits wide, three down to zero. Right. But if we have different requirements in our system, right? Say we need a 32-bit bus, an 8-bit bus, a 16-bit bus. We don't want to have to write a separate Verilog module for each possibility. We want to write one Verilog module that can handle a data bus of any width. And so something called parameters will help us do that, right? So parameter is just going to be a constant value that's declared within the module structure, right? Well, you, it can be used to define a set of attributes for the module, which can characterize its behavior as well as its physical representation. Well, that's a mouthful. Let's go ahead and see how to use it. And then these words should make more sense. Like the attribute we're going to specify is a width of the data bus. And so we'll see, like I said, we'll declare these inside a module. Local scope means that then whatever we set them to, that parameter that value is only local to that module, internal to that module. Uh, it doesn't affect anything in the outside world, except maybe the size of the bus that connects to it. Right? And then we can overwrite it at instantiation time. So if we give it a default value, we'll be able to override that when we create an instance of that module. All right. So let's take a look at how we're going to use a parameter. Right. So we're going to use a keyword parameter. We're going to specify then an identifier name. So if we want to then use the parameter to specify the width of our input lines and our output lines, right? we give it here, I'm giving it a default size. This says it's a four bit decimal eight. The D decimal says that the number following, this says the base of the number that follows. So if you look at the eight, the D says that eight is written in base 10. Right? It allows the environment to interpret that and change it into the correct binary number. Right? Well, we know that decimal eight needs four bits to be represented. So that's why we have to say here, it's a four bit wide number. If we don't specify its width, um, Cortis Verilog will actually make it a 32-bit signal, and we don't want it to be that big. Right. And then we will use this parameter width. Instead of saying, say, 7 down to 1 for 8 bits, we can say width minus 1 down to 0. Right? Because 7 down to 0 is our 8-bit signal. If this is 8, 8 minus 1 makes this 7. Right? We have 7 down to 1. All right. We're also going to see, we're going to, have to, we're going to have to use behavioral Verilog to specify our circuit. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a Cordis example. Right. Here is the example we were using for the uh, bitwise version of the two to one MUX. Right, we had input, output, input lines, output was MUX out, right? We had our select signal that was one bit wide. Right. Well, we don't want to just go ahead here and change the data line. So let's just say that I made this say four down to zero. And I make this four down to zero. So the output is the same as the input. All right. Let's just go ahead and run analysis and synthesis on that. All right, we're waiting for its output and we're waiting to see a warning that it generates. All right, so previously, we've only seen this warning on number of processors, which I said we could ignore, but we have to then always look at the other warnings it generates. And if you get a big long list of things, if you wanna go see just the warnings, right here on the yellow triangle, click on that, it'll show you the warnings. Using design file mux2to1.bdf is not 
specify, oh, sorry. I actually did not add this file to the current project. So it was running off of the last block diagram, which I've actually removed from the project. So let me set that as top level. I apologize. And we have to run analysis and synthesis again. So yeah, that warning was important because it was trying to compile against something that didn't even exist. I didn't mean to do that. Like I said, always good to look at the warnings. All right. So our warnings scroll by. I'm going to click on this. And this is the one I wanted you to see. Design contains four input pins that do not drive logic. Notice there's a little arrow out here to the left if you want to see more. All right. No output dependent on pin I1, I2, I3, I4. All right. Oh, I did say four down to zero, which gives us five bits wide. All right. No output dependent on input pin I1. Hmm. It's not complaining about I1 at bit zero. Right? And it's not complaining about I0. Here's the problem. When select is one, it's going to drive then the output. Right? The output will be whatever's on line I1. And here's how bitwise comparisons work. So when select is a one bit binary one, I1 is five bits wide. All right, maybe I'll use multiple line comments. Okay, so let's say, let I1 be equal to, right, a five bit binary, one, 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 one. Let's just say that that is what's sitting on line I1. The operation of S and I1 will look like this. Bitwise means it compares bit pairs. Right? When they're both the same size, so when S is a one-bit signal, I1 is a one-bit signal, we have no problem. But now that they're multiple bit signals, it's going to do something like this. It's going to create something like this. You can think of S as being represented by a signal that looks like this where the value of S is going to go in the least significant bit position. I1, well, we just said that I1 is represented by this. So what happens, right, when we and S and I1? Right, it is a bitwise comparison. Well, what is zero and it was one? Zero, 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 one. And the result of this then, the result of this term, what would come through on the output line if these were actually connected and driving logic would be 0, 0, 0, 1. But we know that when S is 1, the multiplexer output should give us whatever's on this input line. We should see all five ones. Well, the problem is, is there's that mismatch between S being a one bit signal. And this is why we do not use then bitwise operators that are of different widths in these expressions. Now, there are methods where we could concatenate bits of one onto here and force this to be one. Um, those are a little bit beyond our scope of what we're doing right now. And it's not a great solution. For us, what we want to do is we want to go to the behavioral Verilog that we've seen, right? So we want to go to something that starts looking more like this, like we've done the case statement before. We could do the case statement, we could do the if statement, right? So let's bring up a Verilog module, right, with the case statement. And I want to save this as file, save as Verilog bus with mismatch. I don't want to save that as a good example. And 
this was my good example. I want to go back and clean that up for future use. That should be fine. All right, so let's remove these two items from the project. Let's go out and find that case example or Mm -hmm. Or we can write the case example. Here's the if. All right, let's go ahead and write a new one. File, new. Let's write a new one from scratch. Verilog HDL. All right. 221 mux width. So the width defines input, output bus width. All right, so module right. mux two to one. Let's do the case. All right, so let's still have in zero or I zero, I one, S and M. All right, and we're still gonna say input no, sorry. We're going to say parameter, right? We're going to call it width, and we're going to say it's a four-bit binary. I'm going to say it's a one zero zero, right? Decimal value eight. Okay. Now let's use it to define. So actually, I should say constant value, right? Let's say input wire with minus one down to zero, I zero, I one, input wire right, S, output wire M, sorry, M is going to be width minus one down to zero, M. All right. Remember the bus width of the input and the output has to be the same. All right, when we create an instance of this module and we define this as being eight, then eight minus one is seven, seven down to zero will give us an eight bit wide bus. Right. So that's how we use the parameter within here to define this. All right, now let's write an always block. Always at, remember the other, in a previous lecture when we defined, uh, this is called behavioral Verilog. Whenever we write an always block, we have to have a sensitivity list. So this circuit, the output of the circuit M is going to be sensitive to changes in S, I0, and I1. That's what goes in our sensitivity list. We could say begin to start the beginning of the block, end for the end of the block, and then we were going to write this with a case statement, and that case statement says we want you to evaluate S, Right, when S is a one bit binary zero, then we need an output signal. Now, we can't say that M is equal to I zero. Well, I'm gonna say that we're going to generate a compilation error so you can see that error. Otherwise, in the case when S is a one, one bit binary one, we want M to be equal to I one. And then we have an end case statement that goes with the syntax. All right, let's see if I've got my syntax correct. All right, so let's write this like this and save this in two to one case. All right, that adds it to the project environment. Let's make it the top level entity and so we can compile against it. And let's wait for that error to pop up.
All right, <clears throat> here it comes. It says, and if you wanna see just the errors, click here on the red, Verilog HDL syntax error at MUX, two to one case, line five, near end of file expecting end module. Oh yes, I created another error that I didn't mean to. I seem to be good at that some days. Some days just better than other, right? End module. I'm sure you probably all caught that. Well, I was busy talking and not thinking. So now we, ha we have to save. So anytime you make a change, you save it and you have to run analysis again till our errors go away. But we should still see an error coming up with this. I'm gonna close that, close this, close this. I'm just interested in this one. Here we go. All right. Verilog HDL, procedural assignment error at MUX 2 to 1 case 19. Object M on the left hand side of, a of assignment must have a variable data type. So here, number 19 and number 20 must have a variable data type. What that means is this has to be a reg type. When we talked about behavioral Verilog in a previous lecture, we said that any assignment operators that we find inside an always block, which is called a procedural block. So HDL procedural assignment, this assignment statement is inside what's called a procedural block. A procedural block begins with an always keyword. This signal, variable data type, well, it has to be a reg type. So we need to declare reg, and I'm just gonna call this RM. And the, I'm going to assign then the reg information to the wire eventually. So that has to be the same width as M. All right, sometimes I just call the reg variables, I add an R into the name, so I know that that's the reg version. We have to assign then to M the red signal. So out here, this is continuous assignment. This basically represents hardware. It does represent hardware. Continuous assignment is a way of wiring this red signal to the output. Here, then we use our red signal. So these have to be of reg type on the left-hand side. Right-hand side could be any data type. Here in this continuous assignment statement on the left-hand side of this continuous assignment statement, left-hand side has to be a wire type. Right-hand side can be a wire, constant, reg, any type. All right, just things in the syntax we have to get used to. All right, I saved it. Let's run analysis and synthesis again. Oh, good, no errors. Let's go to the tools menu. Tools, let's see, we said Netlist viewers, RTL viewer. Let's take a look at what kind of hardware was generated. All right, so similar to what we saw the other day with the case statement, right? For S, it, so for the case statement, it actually then implements a decoder. And then for the logic inside, it actually implemented a MUX. But what it did is see the shadow here? There are actually seven of these MUXs, right? There's one for uh, the zero bit pairs, the one bit pairs, the two bit pairs, the three bit pairs. So each one of these bits has its own MUX. In the same way as we drew that schematic where we had to have a two to one MUX for every single bit in the input lines when we did the four bit example, it's done the same thing here. This is what this set of shadows mean, that there are multiple multiplexers here, right? So if we click on this over here, right, we can see that there are these multiple bits here. All right, there's already coder, it highlights that, right? And it thinks of this as a logic primitive in its library that it has. All right, so there's our hardware. Right, we could go ahead and simulate this. All right, but what we want to do is we actually want to create an instance of this in order to be able to simulate it. 
So let's go back then to our slides. All right, so we went through these steps here. All right, we went through these steps. Oh, uh, I didn't show you default. Something you can do whenever you have a case statement is if you have, uh, if you've not specified all the different cases, you can say, you can use the keyword default and just say, make, make that signal a certain value in the case of where you didn't define the case statements. We'll do that when we uh, use a seven segment display to uh, implement decimal zero through nine and have some other cases we don't want to address. Uh, so I should probably update the slides to actually change that example. I think I will because we are really not ready for that yet. All right, so let's define both of those cases. All right. Now what we want to do is we want to create an instance of this module. All right, and so we're going to write a module that's kind of like a top level module. It's going to create an instance of this. We will maybe name our inputs X and Y. Maybe our output in this example was F out. We'll have uh, a wire named select and we'll create an instance of our two to one mux. And we'll see then that we can then specify, we can pass into that instance when we create it, here this syntax, the pound, the parentheses and then the number three inside says to pass this value of three to any parameter that's in there. Well, we only have one parameter, right? If there are multiple parameters, you have a comma separated list. The first thing in the list goes the first parameter, you find in your module, the next thing in the list goes to the next parameter. We've only got one parameter in our list, so we won't worry about that. But yes, we redefine the parameter right, using this pound operator. So let's just go back to our, this case. We want to make our top level module. So file, new, Verilog file, all right. Create an instance of the two to one mux, right? So keyword module, you don't have to name a top level, but this is going to say be our top controlling level. So here, let's say that our input, right? We know that our input is going to be four bits wide, I'm gonna call it X, I'm gonna call it Y. Input select is going to be one bit wide. Output wire well, the output, if it's the output for the mux, needs to be the same. Actually, let me do this, x, y, s. Let's just do this. All right. We're going to override the width parameter default value, right? So when we create an instance of a module, we use the module's name, right? Here's the module's name. Now, the parameter that we want to override, this goes first, then we have our Instance number, I haven't done this in a while. 
All right, so name connection. Well, the other module right, has inputs, or has connections I0, I1, S, and M. So I'm gonna use that name connection. I'm gonna say, I wanna connect I0. I wanna connect X from this module. And to, right, two to one mux I1, I wanna connect Y. To S, I wanna connect this module select. And to M, I wanna connect this module's signal. F. And all right, we call that top level. Let's set it as the top level. Let's run our analysis and synthesis. All right, design contains two input pins that do not drive logic. Well, that is because I made this a four bit wide signal, right? And I said to only make this a three bit. Right, because we're using one. Sorry, I should have made that four bits wide. This is four bits wide. I want the other to be four bits wide. I was thinking of the width minus one and I didn't make the right width. All right. So this needs to be four bits wide right, to match that. That's why we got that warning about it. two of those pins, right? Those bit three values not driving logic. All right, well, I got that parallel compilation warning. Let's go ahead and simulate this. Well, new vector waveform, set end time. Let's see. Oh, well, let's just go with the 80 nano. Turn another bus. Uh, our output, I want to show that down below. Select, all right, I'm going to make an 80 second clock. All right. So right now, this is all zeros. I'm going to leave it at zero. This, I'm just going to drive to all ones. All right, so we can simply see that when we're getting the output that's sitting there on X, we're going to get all zeros, we're getting the output that's sitting on one, or on Y, we're gonna get all ones. Save this. Let's run it. All right, so let's take, so notice right here, X is eight bits wide. It actually created a piece of hardware using that module. That was only, sorry, I said eight bits. It's four bits wide. Even though the default value in that other module was eight bits, because we overrode the parameter with that pound three in parentheses, right? At when we instantiated it, we end up getting a module that's only four bits wide. Right. We can see here, right, when S is, so when select is zero, our output F is whatever's on line X. Right, when select is one, our output is whatever is on line Y. Right. Uh, and we could change this up a bit if we wanted to. All right, so I'm just going to put in a different binary pattern. All possible combinations for X. Control S to resave. Let's resimulate. Uh, 
Okay, so now here we can see when select is zero, right, whatever happens to be on X, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can see that's coming out on our output here, F, right, it has the individual bits, right, F zero has whatever is on X zero, F one has whatever is on X one, right. So I just wanted you to see that Right, if we change that pattern, it wasn't just a fluke, we were getting out zeros, it's going to match. Again, over here, when we get to where select is one, it ignores everything on X and only shows us whatever's on Y. Right. So let's take a look at what would happen then if we don't override. So if we don't override the parameter, It should use that default value that we declared. So I save that. Let's run analysis and synthesis and see if we get out any sort of warning. What I'm doing now, let me make that clear, is a bad idea, right? We've got a default parameter of eight. Our top level module is only four bits wide. It's a bad idea to do that, right? And I want you to then see Hierarchies have connectivity warnings. See the connect connectivity uh, checks report folder. Oh, and then I have to remember where that one is. Oh, connectivity checks, that was easy, thank goodness. All right. So I went to the compilation report. It said, that, see the connectivity checks report folder, right? Under analysis and synthesis, connectivity checks, click on this. You can see then I1, input warning. Input expression is four bits, right? S7 down to four will be connected to ground. So SIO7 down to four will be connected to ground, right? I1, seven down to four, will be connected to ground, right? M, output, right? Seven down to four has no fan out, so that means it has no connections. When you say something's connected to ground, it's going to be a logic zero, right? And so what it's telling you, right, it's throwing this warning simply because we have a default parameter in here that says make this a bit wide. When we don't override this, this will then make this eight bits wide because we've defined this constant value of eight, decimal eight. So I want you to be aware of those things, right? You always have to match the bus width size, the signal size, it's extremely important to do that. Always pay attention to the warnings that are generated, right? When you see warnings like this, don't ignore them. Right? You have to figure out what's wrong with your design because in the long run, your design will not work correctly when you ignore warnings. All right, so one last thing about parameters here. There's another way that we could override parameters. It uses a keyword called def param. And what that does is you use the name of the, or the instance name. In this case, right, there's a module named mux2 to one parameter. The instance number of it was two, right? So we plan to call it two. So if we say inst2.width, we can use the actual name of the parameter within that module to set it here, and we don't have to pass that sort of generic, that generic pound three list and wondering maybe which parameter is going to be changed. Uh, so that dot notation is used to access the particular parameter. Let's just see if that works here. It should. So we say def param. In this case, I call this instance zero, so instance zero dot width is going to be equal to oh let's make it equal to four to match then this size right. so i'm going to save that let's reanalyze it we should not see that warning come up at all right our sizes should match unless i've made some other silly error All right, no warnings. Uh, yeah, if we were to open this back up, we still have the same signal names. 
right, we should just be able to run the functional simulation again. And of course, then we got the same results because we set this to the same correct widths and we already had our inputs defined. All right, so that's how you can work with parameters in Verilog modules, right? It makes it then easier for us to write one module and then use it in other modules like we did here. We create an instance of it, right? We specify, we have, we can use def param to specify its width Kind of like that method better than the pound method. Um, it's a little more clear which parameter you're setting in which instance number, right? especially when you have multiple instances that may be different sizes. Now for us, in this case, the mux won't be. All right, that is the end of this lecture. All right, the next lecture will be on how to build larger multiplexers, right, such as four to one multiplexers. All right, thanks for watching. Practice some of this on your own. As always, take notes, right? Create these yourselves, run them, simulate them, get a feel for how they work. The more you understand about them, the better able you'll be able to use them in your labs and the better you should do on the test.